it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. In tonight's tale of sci-fi adventure, Commander John Hansen recounts his harrowing adventure with the Electites of Space. The Vampires of Space by Sewell Peasley Wright. Well, sometimes, I know, I must seem like a crotchety old man. Oh, John Hansen, they call me, and roll their eyes as if to say, of course, you have to forgive him on account of his age. But the joke isn't always on me. Not infrequently, I gain much amusement observing these cocky youngsters who strut around in the blue and silver uniforms of the service in which, till more or less recently, I bore the rank of commander. Yeah, there's young Clippin, for instance. Nice, clean youngster. Third officer, I believe, on the Caliobre. One of the newest ships of the Special Patrol Service. He drops in to see me as often as he has leave here at base, to give me the latest news and to coax a yarn, if he can, about the old days. He's courteous, respectful, and yet just a shade condescending. Ah, the condescension of you. Well, there's something new under the sun after all, sir, he commented the other day. That, incidentally, is a saying of Earth, whence the larger part of the service's officer personnel has always been drawn. Something new under the sun. Yeah, that saying probably dates back to an age long before man mastered space. Yes. I lean back more comfortably, happy as always to hear my native earth tongue, and to speak it. Well, the universal language has its obvious advantages. The speech of one's father's wings thought straightest to the mind. <sighs> what now? Creatures of space announced Clippin, importantly, in the fashion of one who brings surprising news. Electites, they call them. Beings who live in space. Beings, anyway. I don't know what you'd call them beings. Hmm. I look past him, down a mighty corridor of my dimming years. Creatures that lived in space. I smiled and stroked my beard. Creatures perhaps twice the height of a man in their greatest dimension, in shape like a crescent, with blunted horns somewhat straightened near the tips, and drawn close together. I spoke slowly, drawing from my own store of memories. A pale red in color, intangible and yet... Oh, you've heard, sir, said Clippin disappointedly. My news is old. Yeah, I've heard, I nodded. Electites, they call them, eh? Well, that's the work of great scientific minds, I presume. Uh, yeah, undoubtedly. Clippin started to wander restlessly around the room. He had a great respect for the laboratory men, with their white coats and their wire solemn airs. He disliked exceedingly to have me present my views regarding these much overrated gentlemen. I've always been a man of action. Pottering over coils and glass vials and pages of figures has always struck me as something not to be included in a man's proper sphere of activity. Well, I believe I'll be leaving, sir. Just dropped in for a moment, Clippin continued. Thought perhaps you hadn't heard of the news. Seems to be causing a great deal of discussion among the officers at base. <laughs> something new under the sun, eh? I chuckled. Why, yes, I mean, you'll agree to that, sir, surely. I believe the lad was slightly upset by my chuckle. No one likes to bear old news. Oh, I'll agree to that, I said, smiling broadly now. It's easier than debating the matter, and an old man like me can't hope to hold his own in an argument with you quick-witted youngsters. Hmm, I'd never really noticed, replied young Clippen, rather acidly. You were particularly averse to argument, sir. Rather the reverse. But I must be moving on. We're going off soon. And you know the routine here at base. He then saluted me. Rather carelessly, I should say. And I returned the salute with a crispness with which the gesture was rendered in my day. 
When he was gone, I turned to my desk and began searching in that huge and capacious drawer in which were kept, helter-skelter, the dusty and faded nondescript mementos of a thousand adventures. I found, at last, what I was seeking. No impressive thing, this. Just a bit of metal, irregular in shape, no larger than my palm, and three times the thickness. One side was smooth, the other was stained as by great heat, and deeply pitted as though it had been steeped in acid. Silently, I turned the bit of metal over and over in my hands. I begged hard for this souvenir, but obtained it only by passing my word its secret would never reach the universe through me. But now, well, now that seal of secrecy had been removed. As I write this, slowly and thoughtfully, as an old man writes, relishing his words for the sake of the memories they bring before his eyes, this bit of metal holds against the vagrant breeze the filled pages of my script. Not an imposing thing, this ancient bit of metal, but to me one of my most precious possessions. It is, beyond doubt, the only fragment of my old ship, the Ertak, now in existence and identifiable. And this is a story that pitted metal and the ship from which it came are the strangest stories in all my storehouse of memories of days when only the highways of the universe had been charted. A breathless adventure awaited him who dared the unknown trails of the special patrol service. The air tuck, as I recall the details now, had just touched at base upon the completion of a routine patrol, one of those monotonous, fruitless affairs which used to prey so upon Corrie's peace of mind. Now, Cory was my first officer on the air tag, and the keenest seeker of trouble I'd ever known. Well, the chief presents his compliments and requests an immediate audience with Commander Hansen, announced one of the brisk little attaches of base, before I'd even had time to brew a second breath of fresh air. I glanced at Cory, who was beside me, and winked. That is, I quickly drew down the lid of one eye, a peculiar little gesture common on her which may mean one of many things. Uh, sounds like something is in the wind, I commented in a swift aside. Better give no leaves until I come back. Right, sir, chuckled Corey. It's about time. I made my way swiftly to the chief's private office and was promptly admitted. I returned my salute crisply and wasted no time in getting to the point. How's your ship, Commander? Good condition? Yeah, prime, sir. Supplies? What's needed could be taken on in two hours. In the service, Earth time was an almost universal standard, except in official documents. Ah, good. The chief picked up a sheaf of papers, mostly standard charts and position reports, I judged, and frowned at them thoughtfully. Well, I've got some work cut out for you, Commander. Two passenger ships have recently been reported lost in space. That wouldn't be so alarming if both had not, well, last reported, been in about the same position. Perhaps it's no more than a coincidence, but with space travel still viewed with a certain doubt by so many, Council feels something should be done to determine the cause of these two losses. Well, accordingly, all ships have been rerouted to avoid the area in which it's presumed these losses took place. Locations of the two ships, together with their routes and last reported positions, are given here. There'll be no formal orders. You ought to cruise until you've determined and, if possible, eliminated the danger, or until you are certain that no further danger exists. He then slid the papers across the desk, and I picked them up. Yes, sir, I said. Uh, will that be all? You understand your orders? Yes, sir. Very well. Good luck, Commander. I saluted and hurried out of the room, back to my impatient first officer. Uh, what's up, sir? He asked eagerly. Well, I can't say that I know, to be truthful. Perhaps nothing. Perhaps a great deal. Give orders to take on all necessary supplies, in double quick time. I promise the chief will be ready to shove off in two hours. I'll meet you in the navigating room give you all the information I have. Corey saluted and rushed away to give the necessary orders. Thoughtfully, I made my way through the narrow, ethan-lighted passageways to the navigating room, where Corey very shortly joined me. 
Briefly, I repeated the chief's conversation. We both bent over the charts and position reports. Hmm. Corey was lost in thought for a moment as he fixed the location in his mind. Rather on the fringe of things. Almost anything could happen out there, sir. That would be on the old Belgrade route, would it not? Yep. And it's still used. However, as you know, by some of the smaller, slower ships making many stops. Or was until the recent order. Well, any guesses as to what we'll find? None, sir. Except the obvious one. Meteorites. Corey nodded. Yeah, some bad swarms now and then, he said seriously. I knew he was thinking of one disastrous experience the Ertak had had, and of scores of narrow escapes. Well, that would be the most likely explanation. Well, that's true. Those ships were old and slow. They could turn about and dodge more easily than a ship of the Ertak speed. At full space speed, we're practically helpless. Can't stop nor change our course in time to avoid an emergency. Well, sir, shrugged Corey. Our job's to find the facts. Well, I took the liberty of telling the men we're able to be ready in an hour and a half. If we are, do we shove off immediately? Yeah, just as soon as everything's checked. I'll leave it to you to give the necessary orders. I know I can depend upon you to waste no time. Right, sir, said Corey, grinning like a schoolboy. We'll waste no time. Just a shade less than two hours after we'd set down at base, we were rising swiftly at maximum atmospheric speed, on our way to a little travelled portion of the universe, where two ships, in rapid succession, had met an unknown fate. I wonder, sir, if uh, you could come to the navigating room at once. It was Kincaid's voice, coming from the instrument in my stateroom. Immediately, Mr. Kincaid. I asked no questions, for I knew my second officer's cool-headed disposition. If something required my attention in the navigating room, in his opinion, then it was something important. I threw on my uniform hurriedly and hastened to Kincaid's side, wondering if at last our days of unrewarded searching were to bear fruit. Oh, perhaps I called you needlessly, sir, Kincaid greeted me apologetically. But, considering the nature of our mission, I thought it best to have your opinion. He motioned toward the two great navigating charts, operated by super radio reflexes, set in the surface of the table before him. In the center of each was the familiar red spark which represented the air attack herself, and all around were the glowing points of greenish light which gave us, in terrestrial terms, the locations of the various bodies to the right and left, above and below. See here, sir, and here. Kincaid's blunt, capable forefingers indicated spots on each of the charts. Have you seen anything like that before? I shook my head slowly. I'd seen instantly the phenomena he'd pointed out. Using again the most understandable terminology, to our right and somewhat above us, nearer by far than any of the charted bodies, was something which registered on our charts as a dim and formless haze of pinkish light. Now the, uh, television, sir, said Kincaid gravely. I bent over the huge hooded disc, so unlike the brilliantly illuminated instruments of today, and studied the scene reflected there. Centered in the field was a group of thousands of strange things, moving swiftly toward the ship. In shape, they were not unlike crescents, with the horns blunted and pushed inward towards each other. They glowed with a reddish radiance which seemed to have hit center in the thickest portion of the crescents, and, despite their appearance, they gave me somehow an uncanny impression that they were in some strange way alive. While they remained in a more or less compact group, their relative positions changed from time to time, not aimlessly as would the insensate bodies drifting thus through the black void of space, but with a sort of intelligent direction. What do you make of them, sir? asked Kincaid, his eyes on my face. Can you place them? No, I admitted, still staring with a fixed fascination at the strange scene in the television disc. Perhaps this is what we've been searching for. Please call Mr. Kari and Mr. Hendricks and ask them to report here immediately. Kincaid hastened to obey the order, while I watched the strange things in the field of the television disc, 
trying to ascertain their nature. Oh, they weren't solid bodies, for even as I viewed them, one was superimposed upon another, and I could see the second quite distinctly through the substance of the first. Nor were they rigid, for now and again one of the crescent arms would move searchingly, almost like a thick, clumsy tentacle. There was something restless, something hungry in the movement of the sharp arms of the things that sent a chill trickling down my spine. Corin and Hendricks arrived together, their curiosity evident. Well, I believe, gentlemen, I said, that we're about to find out the reason why two ships already have disappeared in this vicinity. Look first at the charts, and then here. Part 2 I bent over the charts for a moment, and then stared down into the television disc. Corey was first to speak. What are they? he gasped. Are they alive? That's what we don't know. I believe they are, in a fashion. And if you'll observe... They're headed directly towards us at a speed which must at least be as great as our own. Is that not correct, Mr. Kincaid? Kincaid nodded and began some hasty figuring, taking his readings from the finely ruled lines which divided the charts into little measured squares, and checking speeds with the chronometers set into the wall of the room. I don't understand the way in which they register on our navigating charts, sir, said Hendricks slowly. Hendricks, my youthful third officer, had an inquiring, almost scientific mind. I have often said he was the closest approach to a scientist I have ever seen in the person of an action-loving man. There were a blur of light on the charts, all out of proportion to their actual size. They must be something more than material bodies, more or less. And they are coming towards us, commented Corrie grimly, still bent over the disc, as though they knew what they were doing and meant business. Yes, nodded Kincaid, picking up the paper upon which he'd been figuring. This is just a rule of thumb estimate, but they continue on their present course at their present speed, and we do likewise. They'll be upon us in about an hour and a quarter, less if anything. But I still can't understand their appearance in the charts, muttered Hendricks doggedly, still turning that matter over in his mind. Unless... Unless... Ah, oh, I think I have it, sir. The charts are operated by super-radio reflexes. In other words, electrically. They'd naturally be extremely sensitive to an electrical disturbance. Those things are electrical in nature, highly so. And that's the reason for the flare of light on the charts. Well, sounds logical, said Corrie immediately. The point, as I see it, is not what they are, but what we're to do about them. Do you believe, sir, that they are dangerous? Well, let me ask you some questions to answer that one, I suggested. Two ships are reported lost in space, in this immediate vicinity. We come here to determine the cause of those losses. We find ourselves the evident objective of a horde of strange things which we cannot identify, which Mr. Hendricks here seems to have good reason to believe was somehow electrical in nature. Putting all these facts together, what is the most logical conclusion? Well, that these things cause the lost ships to be reported missing in space, said Hendricks. I then glanced at Kincaid, and he nodded gravely. And you, Mr. Corey? I asked. Corey shrugged. Well, I believe you're right, sir. They seem like such flimsy, harmless things, though, that the disintegrator rays will take care of them without difficulty. Shall I order the ray operators to the station, sir? Uh, do that, please. And take personal charge of the forward projectors, will you? Mr. Hendricks, will you command the aft projectors? Mr. Kincaid and I will carry on here. Well, shall we open fire on them at will? Or upon your orders, sir? Asked Corey. Upon orders, I said. And you'll get your orders as soon as they're in range. I have a feeling we're in for trouble. Oh, I hope so, sir, grinned Corrie from the door. Hendricks followed him silently, but I saw there was a deep, thoughtful frown between his brows. I think, commented Kincaid quietly, that Hendricks is likely to be more useful to us in this manner than Corrie. I nodded and bent over the television disc. The things were perceptibly nearer now, 
The hurtling group nearly filled the disc. There was something horribly eager, horribly malignant in the way they shone, so palely red, and in the fashion in which their blunt tentacles reached out toward the air tide. I glanced up at the earth clock on the wall. The next hour, I said soberly, cannot pass too quickly for me. We had decelerated steadily during the hour, but we were still above maximum atmospheric speed, and at last I gave the order to open fire on the invaders with disintegrator rays. Well, they were close, but of course the rays are not as effective in space as when operating in a more favorable medium, and I wished to make sure of our prey. I pressed the attention signal to Corey's post, and he answered instantly. Ready, Mr. Corey? Ready, sir. Then commence action. Before I could repeat the command to Hendricks, I heard the deepening note of the atomic generators and knew Corey had already begun operations. Together, and silently, Kincaid and I bent over the television disc. We watched for a moment, and then, with one accord, lifted our heads and looked into each other's eyes. Oh, no go, sir, said Kincaid quietly. I nodded. It was evident that the disintegrator rays were useless here. When they struck into the horde of crescent-shaped things coming so hungry toward us, the things changed from red to a sickly yellowish pink and seemed to writhe as though in some discomfort. But that was all. Well, uh, perhaps at closer range? ventured Kincaid. Oh, I think not. If Mr. Hendricks is correct, and I believe he is, these things are not material. They're not matter. Well, as we comprehend the word. And so they can't be disintegrated. Then, sir, uh, how are we to best them? Well, first, we'll need to know more about them. For one thing, their mode of attack. We should know very soon, though. Please recall Mr. Hendricks, and then order all hands to their posts. We may be in for a fight. Hendricks came rushing in breathlessly. The rays are useless, sir, he said. They'll be on us in a few minutes. Any further orders? Not yet. Have you any ideas as to their mode of attack? What they can do to us? No, sir. Well, that is no reasonable idea. Then what's your unreasonable theory, Mr. Hendricks? Well, I prefer to make further observation first, he replied. They're close enough now, I think, to watch through the ports. Do I have your permission to unshutter one of the ports? Certainly, sir. The air attack, like all special patrol ships of the period, had but a few ports, and these were kept heavily shuttered. Her hull was double, and she was really two ships, one inside the other, the two skins being separated and braced by innumerable trusses. Between the outer and the inner skin, the air pressure was kept at about one half of normal thus distributing the strain of the pressure equally between the two hulls. In order to arrange for a port or an exit, it was necessary to bring the two skins close together at the desired point, and strengthen this weak point with many braces. As a further protection against an emergency, and a fighting ship must be prepared against all emergencies, the ports were shuttered with massive doors of solid metal, hermetically fitted. I'm explaining this so much in detail for the benefit of those not familiar with the ships of my day, and because this information is necessary that one may have a complete understanding of subsequent events. Hendricks, upon receiving my permission, sprang to one of the two ports in the navigating room and unshuttered it. The lights, please, he asked over his shoulder. Kincaid nodded and switched off the ethon tubes which illuminated the room. The three of us then crowded around the recessed port. Well, the things were not only close, they were almost upon us. Even as we looked, one of them swept by the port so close that, save for the thick crystal, one might have reached out into space and touched it. The television disc had represented them very accurately. They were, in their greatest dimension, perhaps twice the height of a man, and at close range their reddish color was more brilliant than I'd imagined. In the thickest portion of the crescent, which seemed to be the nucleus, the radiance of the thing was almost blinding. It was obvious now that they were not material bodies. There were no definite boundaries to their bodies, in fact. 
They faded off into nothingness, into a sort of fringe, almost like a dim halo. An attention signal sounded sharply, and Kincaid groped his way swiftly to answer it. It's Corey, sir, he said. He reports his rays are utterly useless, and asks for further orders. Right, tell him to cease action, and report here immediately. I turned to Hendricks, staring out the port beside me. Well, what do you make of him now? Before he could reply, Kincaid called out sharply. Come here, sir. The charts are out of commission. We've gone blind. Well, that was true. The charts were no more than twin rectangles of lambent red flame, with a yellow spark glowing dimly in the center of each. The fine black lines ruled in the surface, showing clearly against the wavering red fire. Mr. Hendricks, I snapped. Let's have your theory, reasonable or otherwise. Hendricks, his face pressed at an angle against one side of the port, turned toward me and swung the shutter into place. Kincaid snapped on the light. It's uh, no longer a theory, sir, he said in a choked, hushed voice, although it's still unreasonable. These things are eating us. Eating us? Corey's voice joined Kincaid's and mine in the exclamation of amazement. He'd just entered the navigating room in response to my order. Eroding us, absorbing us, whatever you want to call it. There's one at work close enough to the port so that I could see it. It's feeding upon our hulls and an electric arc feeds upon its electrodes. Yeah, farewell air attack, said Corey grimly. Anything the rays can lick wins. No, not yet, I contradicted him. Kincaid, what's the nearest body upon which we can set down? N-127, sir, he replied promptly. Just logged her a few minutes ago. He poured hastily through a dog-eared index. Yeah, here it is, N-127. Atmosphere unbreathable, largely nitrogen, oxygen insufficient to support human life. No animal life reported. Insects large, but reported non-poisonous. Vegetation enormous in size. Probably with edible fruits, although reports are incomplete on this score. Water unfit for drinking purpose unless distilled. Land area approximate... Look, that's enough, I interrupted. Mr. Corey set a course for N-127 by the readings on the television instrument. Mr. Kincaid, accelerate to maximum space speed. And set us down on dry land as quickly as emergency speed can put us there. And you, Mr. Hendricks, please tell us all you know, or guess, about our enemy. Hendricks waited, moodily silent, until the ship was coming around on her course, picking up speed every instant. Kincaid had gradually increased the pull of the gravity pads to about twice normal, so that we found it barely possible to move about. The air attack was an old timer, but she could pick up speed when she had to. That would have thrown us all headlong were it not for the artificial gravity anchorage of the pads. Well, it's our guesswork, began Hendrick slowly. So I hope you won't place too much reliance on my theory, sir. I'll just give you my line of reasoning, and you can evaluate it for yourself. These things are creatures of space. No form of life as we know it can live in space, and therefore they're not material. They're not matter like ourselves. Well, from their effect upon the charts, we decided they were electrical in nature. Not made up of atoms and electrons, but of pure electrical energy in an unfamiliar form. Then, remembering that they exist in space, and concluding that they were the destroyers of the two ships we know of, I began wondering how they brought about the destruction, or at least the disappearance, of those two ships. Life of any kind must have something to feed upon. To produce one kind of energy, we must convert, apparently consume, some other kind of energy. Even our atomic generators slowly but surely eat up the metal in which is locked the power which makes this ship's power possible. But in space, well, what could these things feed upon? What if not those troublesome bodies, meteorites? And meteorites, as we know, are largely metallic in composition. And ships are made of metal. Well, here are the only proofs, if proofs you can call them. But these are not wild ideas. First, the disintegrator rays, working upon an electrical principle, 
reacted upon but did not destroy these things, as might be expected from the meeting of two not dissimilar manifestations of energy. And the fact that I did, from the pod, see one of these space things, or part of one, flattened out upon the body of the earth tank, and feeding upon her skin, already roughened and pitted slightly from the thing's hungry activities. Well, Hendrix fell silent then, staring down at the floor. He was only a youngster, and the significance of his remarks was as plain to him as it was to the rest of us. These monsters from the void were truly feeding on the skin of our ship, vampire-like. It would not be long before it would be weakened. Weakened to the danger point. Weakened until we would explode in space like a gigantic bomb, to leave our fragments to whirl onward forever through the darkness and the silence of outer space. And what, sir, do you plan to do when we reach this N-127? Asked Cory. Burn them off with a run through the atmosphere? No, oh, that wouldn't work, I imagine. But I glanced at Hendrix inquiringly, and he shook his head. My only thought was to land, so that we'd have some chance. Outside the ship, we can at least attack. When locked in here, we're helpless. Attack, sir? With what? Asked Kincaid curiously. Well, that I can't answer. But at least we can fight, with solid ground under our feet. And that's something. You're right, sir. Grinned Corey. It was the first smile that had appeared on the faces of any of us in many minutes. And fight we will. If we lose the ship, at least we'll be alive with the hope of rescue. Hendrix glanced up at him and shook his head, smiling crookedly. Oh, you forget, he remarked, that there's no air to breathe on N127. Atmosphere of nitrogen. No water that's drinkable, if the reports are accurate. A breathing mass will not last long. Even those new types. Oh, that's so, said Kincaid. The tanks hold about a ten-hour supply, less if the wearer is working hard or fighting. Well, ten hours, no more, if we didn't find some way to destroy these leeches of space before they destroyed the air tank. During the next half hour, little was said. We were drawing close to our tiny, uninhabited haven, both Corey and Kincaid were busy with their navigation, working in reverse, as it were, from the rough readings of the television disc settings. An ordinarily simple task was made extremely difficult. I helped Corey interpret his headings and kept a weather eye on the gauges over the operating table. We were slipping into the atmospheric fringe of N127, and the surface temperature gauge was slowly climbing. Hendrix sat hunched heavily in a corner, his head bowed in his hand. I believe, said Kincaid at length, I can take over visually now. He unshuttered one of the ports and peered out. N-127 was full ahead of us, and we were dropping sideways towards her at a gradually diminishing speed. The impression given to us, due to the gravity pads in the keel of the ship, was that we were right side up, and N-127 was approaching us swiftly from the side. Vegetation of enormous side is right too said Corey, who had been examining the terrain at close range through the medium of the TV disc. Two of the leaves and some of the weeds will make an awning for the whole ship. Hey, is there any likely place to land, Kincaid? Well, nowhere except along the shore. Then we'll have to do some nice work and lay the air tech parallel to the edge of the water. The beach is narrow, but apparently the only barren portion. Will that be all right, sir? Use your own judgment, but waste no time. Kari, break out the breathing masks and order the man at the airlock exit port to stand by. I'm going out to have a look at these things. May I go with you, sir? asked Hendrix sharply. And me? pleaded Kincaid and Kari in chorus. You, Hendrix, but not you two. The ship needs offices, you know. Then why not me instead of you, sir? argued Kari. You don't know what you're going to be up against. All the more reason I shouldn't be receiving any information second-hand, I said. And as for Hendrix, he's the laboratory man of the air tank. These things are his particular pets. Right, Hendrix? Right, sir, said my third officer grimly. And Corey muttered under his breath, something which sounded very much like profanity, but I let it pass. I knew just how he felt. Part 3 
Oh, I've never liked to wear a breathing mask. I feel shut in, frustrated, more or less helpless. The hiss of the air and the everlasting flip of the exhaust valve disturb me. But they are very handy things to have when you walk out onto a world which has no breathable atmosphere. Well, you've probably seen in the museums the breathing masks of that period. They were very new and modern then, although they certainly appear cumbersome by comparison with the devices of today. Our masks consisted of a huge shirt of airtight, light material, which was belted in tightly around the waist, and bloused out like an ancient balloon when inflated. The armholes were sealed by two heavy bands of elastic, close to the shoulders, and the headpiece was a thin copper, set with a broad, curved band of crystal, which extended from one side to the other, across the front, giving the wearer a clear view of everything except that which was directly behind it. The balloon-like shirt, of course, was designed to hold a small reserve supply of air for an emergency should anything happen to the tank upon the shoulders, or the valve which released the air from it. Oh, they were cumbersome, uncomfortable things, but I donned mine and adjusted the menor, built into the helmet to full strength. I wanted to be sure I kept in communication with both Hendrix and the sentries at the airlock exit, and of course inside the helmet's verbal communication was impossible. I glanced at Hendrix and saw that he was ready and waiting. We were standing inside the airlock, and the mighty door of the port had just finished turning in its threads and was swinging back slowly on its massive gimbals. Let's go, Hendrix, I emanated. Remember, take no chances and keep your eyes open. I remember, sir, replied Hendrix, and together we stepped out onto the coarse gravel of the beach. Before us, waves of an unhealthy, cloudy green rolled slowly, heavily shoreward. But we had no eyes for this, nor for the amazing vegetation of the place, plainly visible on the curving shores. We took a few hurried steps away from the ship, and then turned to survey the monsters which had attacked it. Oh, they literally covered the ship. In several places, their transparent, glowing bodies overlapped. And the size of the air attack ordinarily polished and smooth as the surface of a mirror, were now dull and deeply eroded. Notice, sir, emanated Hendrix excitedly, how much brighter the things are. They are feeding, and they're growing stronger and more brilliant. I... Oh, look out, sir, they're attacking. They're coming for our copper helmets. But I'd seen it as quickly as he had. Half a dozen of the glowing things, sensing in some way the presence of a metal which they apparently preferred to that of the Ertak's hull, suddenly detached themselves and came swarming directly down upon us. I was standing closer to the ship than Hendrix, and they attacked me first. Several of them dropped upon me, their glowing bodies covering the vision piece and blinding me with their light. I waved my arms and started to run blindly, incoherent warnings coming to me through the menor from Hendrix and the sentry. These things had no weight, but they emitted a strange electric warmth which seemed to penetrate my entire body instantly as I ran, unseeingly, trying to find the ship, tearing at the fastenings of my mask as I ran. I could not, of course, enter the ship with these things clinging to my garments. Suddenly I felt water splash under my feet, felt its grateful coolness upon my legs, and with a gasp I realized I had, in my confusion, been running away from the ship instead of toward it. I stopped, trying to get a grip on myself. The belt of the breathing mask came loose, and I tore the thing from me, holding my breath and staring around wildly. The ship was only a few yards away, and Hendrix, his mask already off, was running toward me. Back, I shouted. I'm all right now. Get back. He hesitated for an instant until I caught up with him, and then together we gained the safety of the airlock. Without orders, the men swung shut the ponderous door, and Hendrix and I stood there panting and drawing in breaths of the air tax clean, reviving air. Well, that was one possibility that we overlooked, sir, said Hendrix. Uh, let's see what's happening. We opened the shutter of a port nearby and gazed out onto the beach we'd so hurriedly deserted. There were three or four of the glowing things huddled shapelessly around our abandoned suits, Ragged holes showed in several places in the thin copper helmets. Even as we looked, they dissolved into nothingness, and after a few seconds of hesitation, 
the thing swarmed swiftly back to the ship. Well, I commented, trying to keep my voice reasonably free from the feelings which gripped me. I believe we're beaten, Hendrix. At least we're helpless against them. Our only chance is that they'll leave before they've eaten through the second skin. So long as we still have that, we can live, and perhaps be found. I doubt they'll leave us while there's a scrap of metal left, sir, said Hendrix slowly. Something's brought them from their usual haunts. There's no reason why they should leave a certainty for an uncertainty. But we're not quite through trying. I saw something. Do I have your permission to take another try at them? Alone, sir. You got any chance of success, lad? I asked, searching his eyes. Well, a chance, sir, he replied, his glance never wavering. I can be ready in a few minutes. Then go ahead, on one condition. But you let me come with you. Very good, sir, as you wish. I have two other breathing masks ready. I'll be back very soon. And then he left me hastily, taking the steps to the companionway two at a time. It was nearly an hour before Hendrix returned, bringing with him two of the most amazing pieces of apparatus I've ever seen. To make each of them, he'd taken a flask of compressed air from our emergency stores and run a flexible tube from it to a cylindrical drinking water container. Another tube, which I recognized as being a part of our fire extinguishers and terminating in a metal nozzle, sprouted from the water container. Both tubes were securely sealed into the mouth of the metal cylinder and lengths of hastily knotted rope had been bound around each contrivance so that the two heavy containers, the air flask and the small water tank, could be slung from the shoulders. Here, sir, he said hastily. Get into the breathing mask and put on these things as you see me do. No time to explain anything now, except this. As soon as you're outside the ship, turn the valve that opens the compressed air flask. Hold this hose, coming from the water container, in your right hand. Don't touch the metal nozzle. Use that hose just as you'd use a portable disintegrator ray projector. Well, I nodded and followed his instructions as swiftly as possible. The two containers were heavy, but I adjusted their ropes across my shoulders so that my left hand had easy access to the valve of the air flask. And the water container was under my right arm, where I could have the full use of the hose. <laughs> Let me go first, sir breathed Hendrix as we stood again in the airlock, and the door turned out of its threaded seat and swung open. Keep your eyes on me, and do as I do. He ran heavily out of the ship, his burdens lurching. I saw him turn the petcock of the air flask, and I did likewise. A fine, powerful spray shot from the nozzle of the tube in my right hand, and I whirled around to face the ship. Several of the things were detaching themselves from the ship, and instinctively I turned the spray upon them. Hendrix, I could see out of the corner of my eye, did likewise. And now a most amazing thing happened. The spray seemed to dissolve the crescent-shaped creatures. Where it hit, ragged holes appeared. A terrible hissing, cracking sound came to my ears, even through the muffling mask I wore. It works! It works! Hendrix was crying this over and over, hardly aware in his excitement that he was wearing a menorah. Ah, oh, we are saved. I put down three of the things in as many seconds. The central nucleus and the thickest portion of the crescent was always the last to go, and it seemed to explode in a little shower of crackling sparks. Hendrix accounted for four in the same length of time. Well, keep back, sir, he ordered in a sort of happy delirium. Let them come to us. We'll get them as they come, and they'll come all right. Look at them. Look at them. Right, quick, sir. The thing showed no fear, no intelligence. One by one, they sensed the nearness of the copper helmets we wore and detached themselves from the ship. They moved like rag tongues of flame upon the fat sides of the air tank, crawling, uneasy flame, releasing themselves swiftly one after the other. Our sprays met them in mid-air, and they dissolved like mist, one after the other. I directed my death-dealing spray with a grim delight, and as each glowing heart crackled and exploded, I chuckled to myself. Oh, the sweat was running down my face. I was shaking with excitement, 
One side of the ship was already cleared of those things. And they were slipping over the top now, one or two at a time. And as rapidly as they came, we wiped them out. At last, there came a period in which there were none of those things in sight. None coming over the top of the sorely tried ship. Right, stay here and watch Hendrix, I ordered. I'll look on the other side. I believe we've got them all. I hurried as best I could around to the other side of the air tuck. Her hull was pitted and corroded, but there was no other evidence of the crescent-shaped things which had so nearly brought about the ship's untimely, ghastly end. Hendrix, I emanated happily. Nothing less than complete success. That's ours right now. They're gone, all of them. I slipped the contrivances from my shoulders and then ran back to the other side of the ship. Hendrix was executing some weird sort of dance, patting the containers, swinging them wildly about his body with an understandable fondness. Oh, come inside, you idiot, I suggested. And you tell us how you did it. And see how it feels to be a hero. Well, it was just luck, Hendrix tried to make us believe a few minutes later, when Kincaid, Corey, and myself were through slapping his back and shaking his hands. When you, sir, splashed into the water, I'd just torn off my mask. I saw some of the water fall on one of the things clustered upon your helmet. I distinctly heard it hiss as it fell. And where it fell, it made a ragged hole, which very slowly closed up, leaving a dim spot in the tentacle where the hole had been. As I figure it, the water, to put it crudely, short-circuited the electrical energy of the things. That, too, is just a guess, but I think it's a good one. Of course, it was a long shot, but seemed like our only one. There was nothing more or less than acidulated water in those containers, and the air flasks, of course, were merely to supply the pressure to throw the water out in a powerful spray. It happened to work. There isn't anybody happier about that than I am. I'm young and there's lots of things I want to do before I bleach my bones on a little deserted world like this. A place that isn't even important enough to have a name. Well, this was typical of Hendrix. He was a practical scientist, willing and eager to try out his own devices. A man of action first, as a man should be. Well, none of us, I think spent a really easy moment till the Urtak was back at base. Our outer hull was weakened by at least half. We were obliged to increase the degree of vacuum there and thus place the miniature portion of the load on the inner skin. It was a tricky business, but those old ships were solidly built, and we made it. As soon as I completed my report to the chief, the Urtak was sent instantly to a secret field under heavy guard, and a new outer hull put in place. This can't be made public, the chief warned me. It would ruin the whole future of space travel. People are just learning to accept it as a matter of course. You will swear your man to utter secrecy, and pass me your word, on behalf of your others and yourself, that you will not divulge any details of this trip. Well, the scientists, of course, questioned me for days. They turned up their noses at the crude apparatus Hendricks had made, and we should save the air attack and all her crew. But they kept it, I noticed, for future reference. And all ships were immediately supplied with devices very similar, but more compact, the use of which only chief officers knew. And the scientists, to my knowledge, never did improve greatly on the model made for them by my third officer. Whether or not these devices were ever used, I don't know. The silver sleeves at base are a closed-mouthed crew, Hendrix always held that the group of things which so nearly caused the deaths of all of us had wandered into our portion of the universe now, from some part of space beyond the fringe of our knowledge. At the same source which supplied one brood, may supply another. Evidently from young Clippin's report, this has now happened. And since starting this account, I have determined why the powers that be are willing now to have the knowledge made public. The new psilocyte coating with which all spaceships have been covered is proof against all electrical action. Well, that it's smoother and reduces friction is, in my opinion, no more than a rather haughty explanation. 
It is, in reality, the decidedly belated scientific answer to a question raised back in the heyday of the attack, and my own you. Well, that was many, many years ago, as the crabbed, uncertain writing on these pages proves. And now, rather thankfully, I'm about to place the last of these pages under the curious weight which has held the others in place as I've written. That irregular bit of metal from the hull of the air tank, so deeply pitted on the one side, where those hungry things had sapped our precious strength. Electites, the scientists have dubbed these strange crescent-shaped things, Van Clippen said. Electites, something new under the sun. Well, new to this generation, perhaps, but not to old John Hansen. Uh, space vampires, eh? Why the hell not, I think. Well, another one of the old school classics there from back in the 1930s. Almost a hundred years old now. Probably will be by the time I get finished reading this <laughs> series of stories. Lots more of those to come. I don't know them too often, but they do bring a lot of pleasure to me. And I hope you enjoy them too. Well, um, I have something big planned. Couldn't have a chance to finish it today, but maybe tomorrow or Wednesday. Uh, definitely going to get something tomorrow and probably on Thursday... Yeah, I don't know. Don't know what I'm talking about right now. Right. Till the next time, my dear friends. Um, very, very sweet dreams. Bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook. Twitter, Instagram, you can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.